It's not easy to follow Bobby McFerrin. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll do my best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. So that was a little uh, drum improv, freestyling. So the, the idea with freestyling is that we try to uh, take, gather the resources of the moment. And the resources of the moment are the drum, my experience as a drummer, and all of you in the room, the sound of the room, sound of the, the, sound of the drum today, because the drum changes every day. So freestyling is trying to muster all of those the resources that we have in the moment and see if we can say something and connect with each other so that we can do some, say something that's going to have some meaning for all of us. Improvisations are ephemeral, so they're, they come in the moment. I've never played that particular sequence before. I'll never play it again. I have to admit I've played plenty of solos that we can all be thankful that I'll, you'll never hear again, actually. <laughs> And it occurs to me that life is actually like that. So life, moment by moment, we're stepping into the unknown. So it's a mystery, right? So we don't know what's going to happen from moment to moment. And it's really our charge to see if we can muster the resources of the moment and see if we can make a connection, to see if we can actually make meaning out of the moment. Now sometimes it looks like life is sort of predictable. How many of you saw the Bill Murray movie, Groundhog's Day. All right, so that's a, that's a mindfulness movie. In the mindfulness community, that's like one of the A movies. So in that movie, uh, Bill Murray's character is going through life, and he's, what starts to happen is like every day seems like the last day, right? So he wakes up, 7 o'clock in the morning, the clock goes off, he shuts the alarm off, and he's just kind of, he's a robot going through life. And it can start to look like that because even though we, we're moving through this improvisation all of the time, we have lots of rituals and we have familiar activities that kind of punctuate this ongoing improvisation. And I think what happens with us is that we, we start looking at only the goals. And so we, we start looking at the destiny. That's what we focus on all of the time. And as Eric said, it's really about focusing on the small things. So if it's all about the goals, where we're going to get, what we're going to do, what we're going to accomplish, and life becomes kind of this problem that we're going to solve, then the only thing that we're really paying attention to is those kind of accomplishment moments. And then at some point in our life, we get to the point where we think, is this all there is? Is this really the whole thing? And that's what that movie is about, right? Where he, he has to figure out, like, what's going on? Because it, it's, it seems meaningless at that point. Because it turns out that the goals and those kind of big moments in a way are sort of arbitrary. It's actually the moment by moment, the details of life that give it its vitality. 
So how can we do that? How can we live like that? How can we notice the details of life and really be tuned into that? So the title of this talk is Improvisation, Call and Response, and Why Mindfulness Matters. So improvisation, being flexible, being spontaneous, being in the midst of the creative energy of being alive. Call and response is like the uh, dynamic function that's happening. So when I was playing, I was trying. Again, it was like hard to follow Bobby. That's, <laughs> Bobby's awesome. But I was trying to stay with each moment. So I would make an iteration, and then that becomes the next call. And then that next call, I make a response, and that response becomes the next call. That's what our life is like, right? So you meet somebody, you say something, they say something back, or they don't. Either way, it's still a response. So we're always responding in the moment, just this circle of call and response, and seeing if we can stay with it. That's really the trick. So why mindfulness? What about mindfulness? So I think why mindfulness, because Everybody we know, everybody you've ever met, everybody you will ever meet, wants to be happy. And they want the people that they know and love to be happy. I think it's also true that everybody you've ever met and that everybody that you'll ever meet experiences a gap between what they aspire to and what their lived reality is. So there's a gap when we're in the midst of a conversation and we start judging the other person. There's a gap when our incessant little commentary mind drags us down into depression or pushes us into anxiety and we can't find that inherent peace, that wholeness that's really our birthright. There's a gap every time <clears throat> that we think or behave in a way that doesn't, doesn't take into account the well-being of all life forms. And when we experience those gaps, we suffer. There's pain. And why mindfulness, I think, is because we know that that gap exists for all of us. And I'm not sure you can completely close it, but we can definitely narrow it. And the tools to do that are learnable. They're available to you, and they're learnable. So I've been playing music since I was a young boy. I started when I was maybe 9 or 10 years old. I got turned on by the Beatles, you know, like lots of people my age. And then after that, uh, a number of really cool experiences. I saw a weather report. I saw a weather report and uh, Paul Winter Consort in the same year. And then, like, that was it. That's what I was going to do. Yeah, I, somebody's clapping. For which one? Both or? Both. Both, yeah. Great groups. Really inspirational for me and it really, it, you know, pointed me. I was already moving in that direction, but then it was like, now I was on a, a high-speed train at that point. And then, so then I started playing in bands. So I'd already received a couple of calls. I'm responding, right? Call and response thing is happening in my life. So then I started playing in bands. <clears throat> and when I was in my early 20s, I was playing with, in a band. And Scott, who put these microphones on me, was in that same band. And I had an experience, and it was an experience that I, I didn't think, at the time, I didn't think I'd ever had this experience before. In retrospect, I realized I'm, I may have had something like that when I was a younger person, but not so profound. And the experience was uh, what many people describe as getting lost in the music, or being in the zone, or being in flow. So we use that kind of language. So the experience was that I'm playing with the band, and uh, it wasn't some grand deal. We were actually at a Holiday Inn playing for somebody's wedding. And I, I hope that the wedding was uh, as auspicious for them as it was for me. <clears throat> and what happened was, uh, for the first time that I could remember in my life, the, the gap between me, what I think of as me, you know, so how it is we're doing something and then we're like watching ourselves do it, that gap between what I thought of as me or consciousness or however you want to think about it, and what I was doing completely disappeared. So there was just music. It wasn't me playing music. It was just music. And 
I had never felt that free in my life. I had never felt that happy or free and powerful and connected to everything else. So then, so that now the, you know, that sealed the deal for me. So I was going to pursue music for sure. And part of the reason that I was going to pursue music wasn't just so I could get hot girls. It was going to be because I, I actually, th that might have been part of it still, but, <clears throat> but there was something bigger and better to go after. And it was to have an experience like that because I knew in my heart that once you know that's possible, you can't pretend that it's not. And so, uh, so music has been a great teacher for me in all these years. And, and I've had lots of those experiences. It changes over time and the way you think about it changes over time. Music is a great teacher because the feedback loop is so immediate. You know, if you're playing and you start thinking about where you're having lunch tomorrow or you really want to impress that person that just walked into the room, the hot girl, then pretty soon, right, you know, like you know there's a mistake coming, you know. And, and one cool thing is if when you play with people long enough and you really get to know their playing, you can actually start to hear mistakes before they make them, kind of. Because it's kind of like fish. I always wondered, like, how do fish do that? Fish and birds, you know what I mean? I know there's research about it. I don't know what it is. But, you know, when they, they all move like this, I, I mean, what they're doing is they're being mindful somehow. I don't know if it's chemical or, you know, who knows what it is. But what they're doing is they're paying attention. And it's like that in a band. When you're with somebody for a long time and you hear something start, like, you, you don't, can't even hear it, actually. It's more like you feel it. You feel something happening and, you just, and everybody starts adjusting. That's what bands are about. And the better the band, the higher the level of adjustment. So that we don't hear it, right? It's just like totally happening. But the best, even Bobby makes mistakes. <clears throat> but music wasn't quite enough. So I was learning how to be that way in life more and more. But music wasn't quite enough. And so I needed some crisis to point me in the direction of meditation. And because when I had some anxiety when I was in my late 20s, <clears throat> just kind of normal life stuff, but I didn't have the skills to cope with it. Like I realized like I knew how to kind of merge with the moment under certain circumstances, but under other circumstances I didn't. So I took on meditation. And so for all of these years, music and meditation have been uh, my greatest teachers in terms of really learning how to pay attention moment by moment by moment, or at least trying. I fail often, but, but I know where home is. I've really established the ability to remember where home is, how to return to that place where my activity and me, or the activity, it's not my activity, the activity, and me, which is also kind of not really even me. It's like all of us doing this thing together, which is part of the spirit of improvisation. It's like I can't actually do it on my own. Knowing that, having that sensibility, is never far away for me anymore. So training as a meditator for 30 some years now, when something comes up that it's kind of like out of the comfort zone, I, I immediately move toward becoming whole with it. So I have a story that I want to leave you with. Uh, for years I played with a, a group called Imp Orc, Improvisational Orchestra in the Twin Cities. It was a, a varied size and varied instrumentation depending on the, the time and who was available. And we used, to bring, uh, we used to bring guest artists in, some really good ones. Don Cherry played with us, Roscoe Mitchell. Um, and we used to bring a guy from New York in, a guy named Butch Morris. And Butch became very well known, actually, as a, a, a person who conducted improvisational orchestras, which is sort of like an oxymoron, right? <coughs> He developed a style called conduction. And so, uh, and what, what the style was is that Butch had all of these signals. So let's say you're the orchestra and you've got the horns over here. And so if, if he wanted the horns to play a rhythmic figure, for example, he would tap out, he, first he would identify who he wants to be part of the, that section. And he could, you know, divide it up any way he wanted to, tap out a rhythm, and then they would interpret the rhythm or a melody. Rhythms were easy to watch. Melodies were difficult, right? So if I, you know, if I section this group off and then I give you that as the melody, you're all, you have to interpret it. And then if he liked what he got, he had a way to save it. So he could save it, he could loop it, 
He could save it, have you stop, bring it back later. He had, so there were all these signals. So you had like the rehearsals were intense and Butch was intense. So <clears throat> we rehearsed for the week. I can't remember if this was the time or not, but uh, and one, one time that we worked with him, he actually made the piano player cry. She had to leave the rehearsal. It was so intense because you could not take your eyes off him for a moment. So anyway, we worked for the week. Great rehearsal week. Uh, we have this big concert at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis on a Saturday night, sold out, great audience. We get, we're moving through the night, we're moving through the night, and the music has been great. Like, we're so on it, you know, great week of rehearsal. So we get to the last piece, and Butch has built this incredible piece. We've got this great rhythm happening. He's got melodies moving in and out, and he's got the string section playing beautiful pads, and he's just got this thing going, and like, Everybody in the room can feel it, and it's building, it's building, it's building. And, and Butch, I think Butch liked me. He, he, you know, he and I got along pretty well. And so he turned to me and asked me to solo. So we have this thing, and I can tell he's like building this thing up, and now he wants me to bring my spirit to it. So it's like, whoa, yeah, I'm ready for this. So I start playing, I start playing, and now the energy is building, building, building. I mean, it's getting wild now, and I can feel it in the room, and I can, he, I can hear him bringing all the energy up. So he's building it to a climax, and we're all just like, everything's totally cooking. You know, like, like now the room is having this experience that I had when I was younger where we're merging with the whole thing. You know how magical it gets like that? It was like that. So he's building it up, he's building it up, and he completely cuts for this dramatic stop except that I had forgot the cardinal rule with Butch, which was to watch him 100% of the time. And I had made it about me. I had forgot to be mindful in that way. I really forgot what the point was because I, was, I got so intoxicated with the moment. And so the band stopped, and I heard the band stop, but I was in the middle of a stroke. Boom. I hit, and everybody in the room knew that I had hit late. I looked at Butch. If Butch would have been close enough, he would have strangled me. <laughs> but he didn't need to because I had already broken my heart, and I knew I broke his heart. So the reason that we need to be mindful is that. We don't want to break each other's hearts. We want to improvise a world that can be even more beautiful than it is today. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.